Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brandforsk and this result webinar. And uh, today we will get a presentation of the results from the project validation of uh, a VR evacuation experiment, behavior, decision making, and eye movement with eye track. And uh, Sylvia and Axel will present the project. And after the presentation, they will answer your questions. Now, uh, Axel and Sylvia, uh, would you like to say hi and uh, Introduce yourself. Of course. Hello, I'm Axel Mosberg. I'm a technical manager at a consultancy firm called Brandskyddslaget. And I'm also a industrial PhD student at Lund University, where I am colleague with Sylvia. Um, I'm Sylvia Arias, and I'm a PhD student also at Lund University. Um, and I have been doing my research mostly on VR. And it was a great collaboration to do this project uh, with Axel too. Okay, thank you. Just a few words about Brownforsk. Um, we have a vision. Uh, we work for a fire safe society built on knowledge. And we develop and communicate knowledge, uh, mostly research, to limit the negative consequences of fire in the society. Uh, we started in 1979, and since last year we are a foundation. Uh, we have supporting organizations that fund every, everything that we do, and this makes us a collaboration between many parts of the society. And the funding so far this, is, it, this year is about 630,000 euro. And of course, we spend the money mostly on research. Uh, we also use them for research, result communication, uh, like this webinar, for example. We also have a research school for practicing fire safety engineers in the fire services, and that makes them part-time PhD students uh, beside their work in the fire service. And we also have scholarships for students. Now, these are our supporting organizations, and it's really thanks to them that we can do what we do. And as I said, the funding so far this year is about 630,000 euro. And the program today looks like this. Uh, after this introduction, we will get a presentation of the project. And as I said before, uh, after that, there will be time for questions and discussions. So uh, let's go to the presentation. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'll just like to welcome everyone to this presentation of the research project, validation of a VR evacuation experiment, behavior decision-making eye movement. Uh, the project has been conducted by uh, me, myself, Axel Mosberg. I was be, had the privilege to be project leader. And then we had uh, uh, Silvia Arias, Håkan, Franci Håkan Francis, and Jonathan Wahlqvist from Lund University, and Daniel Nielsen from the University of Canterbury. Uh, so just a short slide showing the collaborators in the uh, working group. Uh, also, we've been funded by Brandforsk, of course, that's why we're here, and we would like to say thank you again. Uh, we're very grateful for your funding and for making this project a reality. Uh, and let's go into introductions. Also, I should mention that I will, I will handle an introduction uh, and a description of one of the uh, experiment setups, then I will hand over to Sylvia, who will continue the presentation on uh, what we did in this current project. Uh, so for introductions, uh, evacuation has been studied in many different ways uh, for over uh, 70 years. Uh, much focus was given in the beginning and also now in uh, currently and uh, all the time actually uh, has been uh, given in difficult, different physical uh, parameters like movement speeds, people flow, impact of crowding, etc. Uh, and uh, these are, of course, key parameters when we're looking at uh, evacuation. However, uh, behavior has been more acknowledged as one of the key components in uh, evacuation. And this has been gaining uh, a lot of ground since the 1980s, where there were a few groundbreaking studies in the, in the area. Uh, and one reason for uh, behavior studies to be uh, that has 
it has been given less focus in the in the history, uh, at least, is that it's uh, quite complicated uh, and expensive to perform behavioral research. Uh, actually, it's very it can be very hard to set up uh, valid experiments and to conduct them in a proper way, and uh, because of this. Uh, virtual reality has been gaining a lot of ground in evacuation behavior research because it's, uh, it allows the researchers to uh, create environments which maybe not, uh, maybe not exist and also to mutate the environments in, in every physical aspect that the researcher wants to study, uh, which is a great advantage compared to real world experiments. Uh, also, this uh, virtual reality technology, it's still quite new, but it's constantly being improved. Uh, and we have already seen it being applied in several different situations uh, for evacuation, be evacuation behavior research. Uh, three examples are here, uh, all from uh, Lund University, uh, which is the top one is from evacuation from a uh, subway environment. Uh, uh, we have the middle one is uh, from uh, evacuation in uh, uh, CERN, I think. Uh, and also the, the bottom one is uh, uh, driving behavior uh, in smoke, which has all been studied in virtual reality. Um, and when we're using virtual reality, as a, uh, the, the benefits are obvious. Uh, however, uh, without validation, we can't really say that the, uh, the research gives us too much. Uh, so we have some validation studies on virtual reality uh, evacuation research. Uh, however, we do not have uh, much looking in depth at such things as eye movements and uh, walking paths and uh, stuff like that, detailed behavior. Uh, and one reason for this is that uh, the, such data is very scarcely collected in field evacuation experiments. And also it may be that uh, the crew that, or the, uh, the group that are conducting the field research are not the ones conducting the validation research, which uh, gives a limited amount of access to the data performed in the field or the evacuation or the virtual reality uh, research studies. Uh, but in this case, we have a experiments performed in the field, collecting uh, both eye tracking data and walking path and behavioral data in any other way. And also we have, uh, we have all those data components uh, which we can compare to a virtual reality setting. Uh, so that is one of the benefits and one of the reasons we wanted to uh, perform this research. So I'm just going to uh, shortly uh, do a description of the field experiments, which we're going to talk about more. Uh, so this validation research is a comparison between a field and a virtual reality experiment, of course. And the field experiment was uh, conducted in 2018, which was an unannounced evacuation experiment performed in a Swedish high-rise hotel building. Uh, the building was equipped with the evacuation elevators as one of the main escape routes, and that was one of the main areas studied in the field of, uh, experiment. Uh, the exit choice was one of the key, key reasons to, to perform the experiment. Uh, the participants were equipped with the eye tracking glasses that recorded the, their eye movements throughout the, uh, the experiment. And uh, we studied three different scenarios uh, with evacuation from two different hotel rooms. We're going to talk mostly about two of these scenarios. Uh, but Sylvia will give this some more detail later. She, she'll also show you some uh, some pictures from the experiments, uh, comparing them to the VR experiment, uh, which 
uh, which we did in this research. And also that was a, uh, this field experiment was a replica of a previous VR experiment conducted at Lund University in 2016, but performed in a cave environment. And the cave environment and the VR experiment conducted in this um, project uh, will Sylvia talk a bit about uh, now. So I'll hand it over to Sylvia. Thank you. Um, thanks, Axel. Um, as you said, my name is Silvia Arias and I'm a PhD student here at Lund University. Um, these, the results that we're going to show today are from a VR experiment that we ran recently. And as he said, a replica of the physical experiment that he ran before and this other VR experiment that was run by Christine André uh, earlier than that. And you may wonder why we do VR again since we have done it already. And it's, it's for several reasons, but one of them is that the equipment that we use now and what was used then uh, in the cave experiment is different. Here we have an illustration of how the cave works and it's a large um, equipment where the person stands in um, that is different from the head mounted display that we used in the current VR experiment that we call the HMD experiment here. Um, as you see, this is the more typical VR equipment that you are probably familiar with. You just wear it and in front of your eyes this is the only thing you see and you use hand controllers to move around. So this experiment is going to refer, uh, well, it has been done only with a head mounted display that gave us some other, um, other features that the cave couldn't do. Uh, moreover, the cave experiment did not include eye tracking. Um, the physical experiment did and ours did too. So we could also add that to the previous data that didn't have. And also the cave experiment didn't consider an alternative scenario that was at the other end of the building um, that helped us to see if the people chose using the stairs or the elevators based on their position. Uh, were, is it because they were closer or is it because of other reasons? And of course, this allowed us to validate the, the method, the VR method, uh, comparing it directly to the physical uh, data that Axel got. So as he mentioned before, validation is still um, being worked in VR. Um, there are many studies that, that contribute with data and validation is a long um, process that requires lots of experiments being run with and, and matching results to the physical uh, experiments. Uh, but this, in this case, like the, the physical experiment that they did was ideal for the validation because it was a controlled environment and, and it was repeated so many times and VR allowed us to do the very same thing. So that's why it was an opportunity we couldn't miss with a new technology that we thought could and give us some extra um, insight on how people behave in uh, an emergency situation. So as I said, the validation study that we present here uh, was meant to replicate the physical experiment uh, in VR. And we wanted to compare the results and we would say that the VR data uh, if the VR data and the physical experiment data are similar, then we can say that we got, uh, we got success, it worked. Uh, and VR, again, proved that it can replicate reality to a certain extent. So what I'm gonna present here is this, uh, this experiment that we did and it consisted of two scenarios. Um, we got participants, and this is also valid for the physical experiment. We got participants that were recruited uh, with a, well, we got a, like a bogus premise. We told them it was something, the experiment was about something else because we wanted them to react um, by surprise when the alarm went off. We didn't want them to be too ready to act on the alarm if they knew it wasn't about an experiment about evacuation. We collected the same data as in the physical experiment and then we compared the results. And here we see the participants in general in the physical experiment in, in this virtual experiment. We have the two scenarios that were identical and we have a distribution there of, um, of the gender and age. The age, it was uh, an average kind of 10 years older in the physical experiment, but overall it wasn't that much of a, of a difference in terms of age. Um, the ones here that we run in Lund are usually more uh, we have more participants that are students at the university. That's why our age is relatively, um, well, it's younger. 
this is an overview of the building. Uh, this is the, the 16th floor of this high-rise hotel building. It has in total 36 floors, so it's a, a pretty high. Uh, and this, this location was around halfway in the tower. And you can see it's a relatively uh, layout. I mean, you have this long corridor and a couple of rooms on each side. And what is unusual about this is that uh, this building was made in such a way that you will only use one emergency staircase that is probably not the most usual configuration in a high-rise building um, here in Sweden. Usually you have to provide two uh, uh, means of egress and what this in the design of this building this was achieved by providing evacuation elevators. Um, these evacuation elevators are of course protected. Uh, as you can see there was also a firefighter elevator there. They, they basically run the same principles. They operate during a fire and they are protected, uh, not like a regular elevator. If you're waiting for the elevator in a safe space, to make sure that people would use these um, elevators for evacuation, there is a voice alarm that tells them that that is possible to do in this building. Here you can see some images, and this is the the, the physical um, corridor, like the the proper one where Axel ran the physical experiment and we have the VR one that we replicated. Um, it is, the VR one was made on a one-to-one -one scale. Um, it was uh, copying absolutely everything and yeah, the similarities uh, you can see they are very high. Uh, but of course you can still tell that the, the VR one is clearly uh, the one on the right that you, you wouldn't, would not be tricked but at the same time is, is really close. Uh, for the equipment we used in the in the physical experiment, it was these eye tracking devices, as you can see in this image here. They are um, basically just like wearing glasses, um, and it has some batteries. And in the virtual experiment, uh, I said we used the head mounted display. It was an HDC Vive. It's just a commercial one, and it had some eye tracking add on um, that was not part of the equipment, but it was meant to uh, be used with this uh, specific equipment. And as of the procedure, uh, we had the participants, as I said, recruited in a bogus experiment. In the case of the physical experiment, they were told it was a study about interior design and they were supposed to go to this room and look around wearing these, uh, these eye trackers. And in VR, it was harder to tell them it was about interior design. Why would you do it in a VR environment and not in the proper place? So we said, okay, we're, this experiment is about VR realism. So we were told to do the same things, go to the room, look around, evaluate how realistic this felt. Um, and when they were there, um, they were giving the instructions in the, in the ground floor, in the lobby, both in the, in the real hotel and in the virtual hotel. So here, these are images from the virtual uh, lobby uh, where well, we had them doing some calibration of the equipment that was necessary for the eye trackers. Um, and they were told to go to this, this room. I mean, there were two rooms, but they were given one room, uh, each participant. They had to go to this one room by themselves, and that was on floor 16, and they were supposed to perform the assessment. Uh, that was the, the bogus task. You can see in these images, and we tried to make the, the lobby kind of lively. It is, again, a replica of the, of the real one, although we took some more liberties here just to make it more simple, but we had some, um, we had some people sitting there in the hallway just to not to be completely empty. As I assumed that during the physical experiment, there were also people in the lobby in general. So participants were told here to follow the arrows around the floor. You can see on the right hand side, there are some white marks on the floor and those are arrows pointing to the elevator lobby. So they got there, they got into the elevator and it was a working elevator in VR and they went all the way to floor 16. And this is the floor 16 again, and here we point out that the two scenarios, the, the scenario one, you can see the room is close to the elevator uh, lobby, so it is really close by. And in room two is the same, but just for, it's close to the stairs. So we wanted to see if being close to one or the other influenced which one you choose. That's why we had two different scenarios. Here you can see this arrows point at the emergency exit signage that were in the hallway, one pointing at the 
at the elevator lobby and the other one pointing at the stairs. There was a third piece of uh, emergency signage that was placed on, on the doors to the elevator lobby. Because as I said, you, for you to be safe waiting for the elevators, the, this lobby has to be able to keep you outside of the, of, well, keep you outside of the smoke layer. And that's why when the alarm goes off, the, the doors shut automatically. So there is a sign, a piece of signage that is on the, on the door leaf that you can only see once the doors are closed. This, this signage points downwards and towards the door. And so you can see uh, this is the location where it was. And as I mentioned before, there was an, a, a firefighter elevator in the real building, but in the VR uh, building, there wasn't one. And there wasn't one for simplicity um, because every time you, you went, you called the elevator button, it counted as if you uh, wanted to take the elevator, no matter what, no matter which button, elevator button it is. So that's a small difference that, there, that we had with the real physical building. So once our participants made it from the lobby to the assigned room, uh, they were looking around in the VR hotel room and then we, uh, we triggered the alarm manually. And it was a voice alarm, as I said, and it was played on a loop, so repeating over and over. And the alarm said in, in other words, it said that it, it, there was a fire in the building and you had to leave immediately. And it also mentions that in this building, the elevators can be used. So the participant will hear that and will decide what to do next. Um, they had also an evacuation plan on the room door, just in any hotel. Uh, nowadays, you will always have one there hanging so they could see and choose where they were going. But of course, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't control whether they will actually look at it or not. It was up to them if they wanted to. Uh, and we also recorded the time it took for them to leave the room, what we call the pre-evacuation time. Once they exited the room, they were in the hallway. And as I said, the elevator lobby doors were closed by then. Um, all the signage was visible and we used the eye trackers to check um, if they looked at a sign, how many times and how, how long each time. And they had to make the decision on whether to use the stairs or the elevators to evacuate the building. When the experiment ended, depended on the, on the experiment itself. In the physical experiment, it was either, oh, the experiment stopped the moment the participant went into the staircase, the emergency stairs, or the moment the participant pressed the elevator call button to get, well, to actually wait for the elevator to use it to leave the building. In the VR experiment, it was a little bit different. It was one of the cases was, of course, when they entered the staircase. I mean, if you're in there, you just go downstairs and, and you're out. Um, but we also wanted to, to see how long will participants uh, or, or, let's see, people be willing to wait for an elevator to come and rescue them. And so in our case, when the participant will, uh, will push the button calling the elevator, we wouldn't stop, we'll just let them wait for up to five minutes um, to see how long are they willing to wait. And that is because if you use elevators for evacuation of a building, um, it is likely that some people in the building will have to wait some time, we don't know how, how long, um, for, for the elevators to actually come. Elevators always um, have a system to decide which one to, to pick up first. And in this case, we assume that the elevator will not come in less than five minutes to this floor. Although the participants could see the screens on the elevators, they could see that the elevators were moving up and down all this time. So we collected how long they were willing to wait there, up to five minutes. After five minutes, we stopped the experiment. And this is actually one of the uh, highlights uh, that I have for, for this project. We were able to collect these waiting times that was not possible to collect in the physical experiment. And that is because um, when that experiment was run, like the hotel, the hotel was not going to do an evacuation every hour or so in the entire building. Like their guests are, were not supposed to be disturbed by the experiment. And what they did was to give, um, well, to empty the floor 16. There were no guests 
once that day and the alarm sounded only on floor 16 and then the the participant would go and if they wanted to use the the elevators pre elevators press the, the call button um but it wasn't it wasn't a good idea to let them evacuate in an elevator with other guests that had no idea an alarm went off. It will only cause confusion. So in VR, that was not a problem uh, and we could collect that time. So this is something that even if you are, even if you have the opportunity to run an experiment in the physical environment, sometimes you just don't, you just cannot, collect all the data that you want. And sometimes in VR, that is much easier. And this, this, is what, this was a case of that. So now I'm gonna present the results that we got. And the results, as you see here, I mean, they're, they're kind of detailed. I'm gonna go one by one, uh, but we're gonna start with uh, pre-evacuation time. The pre-evacuation time, this is how long it took for the participants to leave the room where they were. Um, you can see here the, the pre-evacuation time for participants in the virtual experiment and in the physical experiment. Uh, we capped this plot at 100 uh, seconds, and that is the, the longest that it took um, for, the, for the second and latest participant in the physical experiment, because there was one that took up to 10 minutes there before they left. Uh, we removed that because it's the, the plot wouldn't look that great. Uh, but here you can see uh, overall how long it took, depending on if it was virtual, a virtual experiment or the physical one. So the data on the, on the virtual experiment is not far away from that, from the virtual one. Then we wanted to see uh, the same data, but if we consider the, the language, as I said, this was a voice alarm, and the voice alarm was in two languages. It was in, in the message was in Swedish, and it was also in English. And if you're gonna use a voice alarm, first one message has to go in one language and then the other one. In this case, the Swedish message was first, so the people who did not speak Swedish had to wait maybe 20 seconds until the message was played in English. And this is probably not that big of a difference, only 20 seconds, but the more, the more complex your alarm can be, the more languages you may need to use. It could be that it just takes longer and longer for other people. So we wanted to see if language uh, was a reason why people left, uh, if, for people to take longer to leave. And this is only data for, for the VR experiment uh, based on whether they spoke Swedish or not. In the case of the physical experiment, everybody spoke Swedish fluently, so it wasn't a problem. Um, and here you can see the participants in the non-Swedish speaking group were um, slower to leave the room. But it's, under, it's understandable because as you can see, the, the thick black line shows when the English message was played. And yeah, they, they had to listen to it. Most of them had to listen to it first before understanding what was going on and then decide to leave. Uh, having said that, we collected data on the countries where the participants were raised. Not, the data would, did not ask specifically, do you speak Swedish? Uh, which would have been more accurate. But in general, we estimated that these people likely did not speak Swedish. And this is what we got. So language can play a role. Here again is the same the same data, but here we co and compare it to the physical experiment. Uh, and the maximum time is presented here uh, as the 10 minutes that it took the longest. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the same data. You can see again, there is a difference, um, but you have to consider language to uh, why a difference can be there. Although language may not be the only reason for that. Um, other reasons for that could be the nature of the experiment. Um, as I said before, they were given a, a purpose. So in one, one case, inter analyzed interior design, in the other one, realism. And that was fine. I mean, they were, were given a task. And the difference was the presence of a research, researcher in the room. In the case of the VR experiment, we were in the room with the participant. So the alarm goes off and the participant can tell that I'm not reacting 
which means that, I mean, this was planned in some degree, I guess. Well, in the physical experiment, they were alone in this room and the alarm went off and they did not know if living was, was they, what they were supposed to do. They were told to be in that room and now they had to leave against, against the instructions that they got before. So there was some conflict there, there for, for the participants, while for the VR participants, if there was a conflict, maybe the researcher will have said something uh, when the alarm started. Um, at the same time, because of the researchers standing there, st standing there in the VR case and looking at them, there could be an effect of social influence. And that is, I mean, the participant knew we could see what they were doing in VR. Uh, so they knew they were being observed. And when you know you're being watched, you're more prone to do the right thing, whatever that right thing is. So we think that it could have affected too that the, our VR participants may have moved faster because they knew they were being observed, they knew they were receiving this message, and the right thing to do is to obey the message. That makes you look good. So we cannot remove that, that bias there from the data, but in any case, in the case of the, exper of the physical experiment, the situation was different and probably more natural than a VR experiment because if the alarm, the alarm goes off when you're in a room, you will still have to make your decision just like the, the participants in the physical experiment did. As for exit choice, here we can see the exit choice by experiment. We have the participants in the virtual experiment and in the physical experiment and their decision to use the elevator or the stairs. The results are relatively close, as you can see here in the proportion of participants using each. So the data overall here looks like there is a little difference, but it's not too big. Uh, that difference was not really statistically uh, significant, uh, which means that, well, although you can see a difference in the proportion, um, it could be that it's it is due to um, variability of the data. It could be random, um, that there is a difference because it is, is not significant. And we, when we look at the same data, but we classify it by scenario, again, we consider like the elevators or the stairs and the position where they were near the elevator or near the stairs, we can see that even though, again, we have some uh, preference for the, the stairs. I mean, the, the preference for the stairs is a little bit higher in the case of the scenario two that was near the stairs. Um, again, it wasn't significant, uh, statistically significant of a difference. So you can see, you can say overall that this data was again similar. The, the data gone through the physical experiment and the one through the virtual experiment was close enough uh, for a difference not to be seen. So not statistically different uh, different samples. Then we looked at the walking paths, so how they moved in the hallway. Um, and we wanted to see, in, there were cases of participants who decided to, uh, well, they walked by the elevator lobby doors. Remember, those were closed. And these, these participants walked by it, did not enter. And we, we were not sure uh, well, we figure out several reasons why they may not have entered, but in any case, they did not walk in. And we wanted to see how many participants did so in the physical experiment and in the real and in the virtual one. And here you see in all cases, well, in the two scenarios, in the physical experiment, participants um, pass by the doors more often than in the virtual experiment. Then we looked at the eye tracking data, and this is only for scenario one. And this is again, close to the elevator lobby. And here you can see, well, we could not find any statistically significant difference, but you can see in all cases, this is how, how many times the participants looked at the signage. And for each signage that I mentioned before, the one pointing at the elevator lobby, the one on the doors, and the one pointing at the stairs. In each case, participants looked more at the sign in the VR experiment than in the physical experiment. Although there was, again, no statistically significant difference in scenario one. And then when we look at scenario two, again, same, same scenarios, same signage. Um, but here we do see a difference um, in these two 
In these two cases, the difference was so large that it became statistically significant for a, a p-value, well, the p-value was uh, below 0 0.015, which is really low if you consider a significance level of um, 0 0.05. So here you can see a difference and it is clear in the case of scenario two, participants in the VR experiment look at the signage more than participants in the physical experiment. So these differences may be due to orientation. Uh, there are studies like this one that I mentioned here from Wittmer and Al, and that the spatial orientation is reduced in, in VR. That is that it is harder for you to orient yourself in VR than it is in reality. It can be uh, due to different things. One of them, well, people are studying still, but they consider maybe the reduced field of view is a reason for that. That means in the, in the, the head-mounted display, the equipment that we use for the VR experiment, it reduces the field of view of the, of the user. So it can be because you see less that you, it is harder for you to orient. In, and this is because maybe the way that VR recreates the 3D vision, so the 3D aspect of the vision that you get there, maybe that it doesn't recreate it per perfectly well, and that's why you're still missing some cues that you have gotten in reality where your field of vision is wider. Maybe this lack of orientation is what leads into uh, leads to over prediction. So if you cannot find your way, maybe you in VR try to look at the signs more because you can't, you don't remember how you got in. And this may explain the differences in the walking paths. Maybe because the participants in VR were looking more at the signage, it was less likely for them to miss the door and not walk in. They were actively looking at the signs more. They knew better where they were. So um, the elevator waiting time, this data is only for the VR experiment, as I said before. And of course, it doesn't include the participants that only use the stairs. And here you can see how long they were willing to wait. Remember, we capped the, the waiting time to five minutes. And here is in seconds, it's 300 seconds. Only four participants waited the full 300 seconds. The rest left earlier. And you can see like some were there less than a minute, less than 60 seconds. Uh, so at least in VR, we saw participants are not willing to wait very long. So once we have done that and compared to the physical data, we also wanted to know how realistic the experience was. If the participants did not consider the, the VR experience any realistic, then why would they, why would they behave realistically? If they consider it a video game, why would they behave as, a, as a, they would do in reality? So we wanted to learn how realistic they thought the scenario was in order for us to assess their behavior and also for us to learn and be able to improve future scenarios. So here we see the participants assessment. They did this assessment based on a questionnaire that we gave them afterwards in which we were asking them to rate these sensations from low to high. And here you can see the, the different sensations that we asked. So insecurity, uh, you know, again, like these words were given to them. They had to assess a little bit what, what we meant with that, but it's hard to give them a clear definition because individuals can also think of definitions in different ways or even stress. I mean, for some people, a lot of stress uh, can be, still not that much stress for someone else. So it's a little bit subjective and hard to tell. So one unique person giving you a rate doesn't tell you much, but having a bunch of people giving you their rate gives you an idea of where the, the real perception was. And you see we had insecurity, stress, and fear. And those were really important because we wanted to, on one hand, be sure of the well-being of our participants. We don't want to stress them too much. and and you see like, stress was relatively, um, wasn't too high, it was low. Um, the majority were more on the lower end on fear. It was like, basically no fear. And in insecurity, it was a little bit more wide, but also it depends on their, their own interpretation of the term. And then we looked at disorientation and here you can see a spread. I mean, it's kind of 
more normally distributed, but again, the sample is too low. Um, but there was some level of disorientation. Um, dizziness or nausea, sometimes participants in VR can feel very dizzy or they can feel sick. And it wasn't too bad either. And eye strain where you had some problems with the equipment when you look, uh, that, that didn't seem to be a big problem. On realism, we asked them how realistic it looked. Uh, so and we asked for the, uh, specifically the hotel, the, the lobby that you saw before, the elevator lobby that, where they were waiting, the hallway that you have seen the pictures of, and the hotel room. And again, um, you have a spread, but relatively the realism was uh, overall between mid and high levels, which is pretty good. And then the use of the equipment, we wanted to know if it was hard for them to use the equipment and to and so the hand controllers if they were hard, hard to operate and the navigation in or navigation or locomotion in vr if it was easy for them to move around and this is because if, if it is uncomfortable or you don't really manage to do it properly it is likely that you may not do everything you wanted to do you would just try to finish it as early as possible but you see here we also so got a spread, we're not so sure, but it seems like it wasn't too, it wasn't too hard, especially with navigation. And lastly, we asked them about immersion uh, or presence. Um, the question said, were you immersed in the VR world? Did you forget that you were in a laboratory instead of a hotel? Um, this term of immersion, I mean, sometimes it's used as presence. Uh, if I would say more technically accurate it would be presence, but in this case, we explained the question to the participants. So we wanted to know, did you feel like you were there, basically? And they gave this answer. So it was, we gave them the option of yes and no, and also other, so they, they, they can provide their own. And you see, we had a, a perfect distribution there of the, the, three, the three answers were given as often. And in the case of other, what they would say is, was, well, at the beginning, yes, and late, later, no, or they would say something like, I felt like it was in the two places at the same time, or it would be like, oh, sometimes, on and off. So you have a mix there of how much they felt like they were in the proper physical um, virtual environment. Um, and some... What, what we were considering too was, uh, if you remember these images that I showed you before, the physical environment and the virtual environment, I mean, they looked overall the same, but although you can definitely tell which one is the virtual one. Um, but if you look closer, you will see that there are other differences too. I mean, the, the virtual one it looks darker overall, but at the same time, the, the signage is, seems to pop up some more than in the physical environment. It kind of looks like in the physical one, like the, the signage merges with the surroundings, while in the virtual one is, is clearly there, which could also be a reason why in VR they were looking more at them. So what we were considering after looking at the results was that maybe we should put some more emphasis in how well our virtual scenario replicates the physical one, if we want to do an experiment like this in which we compare one to one. Because it may be that what we think that is close enough for the, the perception of participants is not. And there are tools to do that. Like for example, and we can do the environmental assessment uh, using this semantic environmental description by Kuhler, um, which helps you to, well, you have to, it helps you to see if the two environments are perceived in the same way by people in them. So we could do that to improve our our scenarios, we could try to have people testing the two environments and seeing how how can we improve, how can we make the virtual one feel more like the, the physical one. But that is more like for future research. And oh, also we asked the participants, uh, we wanted to know what they think they would do if the virtual scenario they just experienced would have happened in the real world. So we wanted them to say, I mean, did you, what you do in VR, was it different or not? But the question was exactly, what do you think you would do differently if this scenario happened in the real world? And around half of the participants in the VR experiment say, said they would use the stairs, which is quite interesting because in the physical experiment, that was not the case. Of course, it was not the same sample, but is the, their own prediction of what they would do in reality 
did not match what the participants in the physical experiment did, which is remarkable. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, they, they explained why they used the elevator instead of the stairs uh, as they would do, because they said it, it was the boys. I only used the elevators because of the boys. And that just proves that the voice alarm was very effective. So it did what it was supposed to do. So that, that worked. And as for the conclusions, as we saw, the VR data was similar to the physical data. So in, in some cases, like you can actually have run this experiment in VR and gotten the very same results. Although we saw some differences uh, like for example, the spatial orientation or also like the environment, environmental assessment. Um, so there was some over prediction in how much they looked at the signs, but this also taught us that not just because you build it in a similar way is necessarily recreating in the same way the physical scenario and affects the, the people in it. So we have to look closer on how to recreate a physical scenario in VR. Uh, of course, more research is needed to do that, so to identify the factors that cause these differences in the behavior and maybe to be able to reduce their effect if we cannot just eliminate them. Um, but this VR experiment allowed us to collect data on their waiting times that was not possible to do in the physical experiment, and that on itself is a very uh, positive outcome from this experiment. And I have added here some of the references that we brought up. Um, there is, of course, uh, a report about this and uh, hopefully also a paper to be published in the near future. And that is it. Um, open for some questions. So thank you. Now we have a we have a first question. Oh, before we go to that, I can add that uh, the report is uh, available on the on our webpage, of course, and there's also uh, some some short summaries that you can read. And we have a first question here. Um, was the evacuation plan on the back of the hotel room door in high resolution and able to be easily read? Uh, easily read in the virtual environment? Um, uh, I think I can answer that. Um, it was, well, we tried to keep the proportion of a uh, regular evacuation plan, but we had to make it bigger because in VR it's not that easy to read the small print. Um, at the same time, we didn't want the, the plan to cover the entire the entirety of the door. Um, so some participants play, uh, stood there and were looking at it longer, trying to figure out um, where they were and where to go. Uh, but some other ones took a quick look. It was, I wouldn't say it was, a, it was high resolution in the sense that yes, we tried to make it visible for everybody, um, but some people said they couldn't read it quite well. Right, thank you. Would you like to add anything, Axel? Uh, no, I can just add that in the in the field experiment, we had a, a lot of people uh, glancing at uh, the evacuation plan. I think this is similar behavior as Sylvia is mentioning. Uh, there was a few people uh, standing there and reading it and trying to follow uh, with their finger how to how to walk. But uh, I think that was one or two out of 60, 60 people. Most people were just glancing at it at their way out of the door. Uh, so we, di we didn't, we, we had a, in results wise, we had a lot of people who uh, fixated on it or had a, um, looked at it, but there wasn't from a, a looking at the data, we, we couldn't conclude that there was a lot of people using it in their evacuation, even though they looked at it. Right. Do you know, do you know any other studies on, on how much these, evacuations plan are read uh, in real life? Uh, no, I don't know if out. Sylvia knows any, but uh, for, for my part, I think that the, the, the results we got from the field experiments are the first I've heard of uh, looking at the evacuation plan uh, usage. However, it should be noted here that uh, I have not uh, searched the literature specifically in, in the purpose of finding such data. 
Okay. Yeah, and I, I just as access so that I'm I'm not aware of any any study, um, but also I didn't look for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have a question uh, about: uh, Is it possible to get access to to uh, the VR program, the software, and to to test this? Uh, um, what kind of what kind of software are you using, and and uh, is it available? Um, well, the the scenarios that we made uh, could could be available. We were thinking on how to make them uh, accessible to. Um, what you would need, though, would be uh, an HTC Vive headset. But the way it is made, you also need the eye trackers, and it could be a little bit complicated. Um, now, right now, it is only prepared for running with HTC Vive and with the eye trackers. Um, and it has to be the specific ones because they are set in the code that made the environment. Uh, it could be that in the future we produce a version that is more accessible, uh, but as of right now we don't we don't have any. But what is the name of the software we build the virtual environment in? It's a game software. Well, yeah, we, we we build it with Unity, um, but that is yeah. I mean you don't really need to have Unity to run it um, oh. once it is compiled, so that wouldn't be uh, yeah. an issue. But when we when we do the uh, VR environments, we use uh, Unity to build them and then yes. HTC Vive and you could also use Oculus Rift, I think. Uh, uh, in this case, I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you could. But we, if we produce one that we can put online for people to try because like, the, the experiment is over and um, people could be interested in it, we will have to look at how to make it accessible for several um, different um, pieces of equipment that people may have. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, did you have any awareness of whether participants had prior experience using VR? And if so, uh, was there any correlation with how comfortable they felt operating in a virtual environment? Well, that is, that is a good question. Um, I don't remember specifically if we asked that. Um, but what we do see is that some people are way more comfortable uh, with it. Several of them mentioned that they play video games uh, so that it could be that they're more used to it. Um, from that perspective, maybe they have access to it. We had had participants who have the equipment themselves, so they were very familiar with it. Um, but we, we haven't looked at a correlation in their comfort level operating in, in VR. But we, we are trying to look into that too. How much does it really affect that you had past experience using the equipment? Yeah, you could also add there that we, in, in our uh, other VR studies also, we, we haven't uh, looked at and found such a, uh, or nor found a, such a um, correlation. But I think, Sylvia, that you'd made some work on different VR types uh, also. And discussed at a conference. Am I remembering correctly? Or <laughs> oh yeah. Well, we <laughs> yes, we we are trying to see um, that. So we keep asking them uh, how comfortable they felt and such. And we have tried that in in the several experiments that we have done. Um, but un until now, we haven't seen any. Um, I mean, any any strong evidence that it affects in some way. At the same time, we try to plan our, our VR environments in a way that um, even if you have never touched VR before, it is still natural for you because it replicates the, the real scenario. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, why did they have to wait for so long time for the elevators to come? Five minutes is a long time to wait for an elevator. Uh, uh, what? Was it on, on meant to be so long uh, for the experiment or, or why did you have five minutes? Yeah, maybe I can take that one. Um, the five minutes were chosen because of the previous VR experiment that we mentioned that it was made in this cave environment. In that experiment, they made participants wait up to 20 minutes. 
once they finished the experiment, uh, they realized that most of the people left within the first five minutes. Um, and some of them waited all the, the 20 minutes and in between there were very few. So it was either up to five minutes or longer than 20 minutes um, and very, very few people in between. So we thought, well, if we, we just cap it at five minutes because more, well, the majority of participants in the previous VR experiment left um, before the five minutes. We thought, well, if we see the same in five minutes. Um, we just match the same data that they got before. And this is what we got. I mean, most of our participants left before five minutes. And that, that was the reasoning. And it may, it may seem a long time to wait for an elevator on a regular operation, but in, in, an, in a total evacuation of a building like this, the elevators will be busy in all floors. We talked about more than 30 floors and you don't know how many people are in the other floors. So we didn't think it was unrealistic to wait for five minutes there although we're not very sure how long it exactly would take for everybody to leave the building. Also, uh, just to add some, uh, uh, it is, uh, I mean, it's, it is primarily a, a choice between uh, uh, research uh, experiment economy or what you should call it, because ideally we would wait until the participant no longer waits. That will give us the most amount, amount of data and indefinite waiting time. Uh, if we, as soon as we cap the waiting time, we're losing a lot of data. I mean, if we would have said, yeah, the, a regular elevator arrives at one minute and we cap the, the, the time, the waiting time at one minute, we would know that, yeah, 90% waited one minute, but we would not know how many are willing to wait more than one minute. Uh, in this case, we have we kept it at five minutes, and we the results were that most people will not wait five minutes. However, for those people who waited longer than five minutes, we do not know how long they are actually willing to wait. Uh, and we have done similar trials with uh, the VR experiments where we, that we did in the subway. We had eight minutes waiting time. In those experiments, we had no one waiting for eight minutes. So that's I mean. Uh, in that case, we did not lose any data and we had similar patterns that it was just one or two participants that, that waited longer than five minutes. So five minutes is a good, uh, was deemed to be a good time out of uh, experiment resources to, to not have experiments run, run for half an hour and be able to plan them in accordingly. Uh, it's a bit about that and uh, the yeah, we deemed that we wouldn't lose too much data uh, in in having that uh, waiting time. Okay, thank you. And we have another question here. Um, have you been uh, collaborating to exchange experience um, experiences internationally? For example, the Norwegian Road Administration have previously been very interested in, in the use of VR for testing emergency information. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I could start, but I think Sylvia is more uh, <laughs> suitable for this question because I know she has several uh, international uh, collaborations uh, while uh, I have not uh, really. The, the collaboration we had internationally on this is, is with uh, the University of Canterbury, which is mainly because Daniel Nielsen had moved to New Zealand. Uh, however, we will run, the plan is to run similar experiments in in New Zealand uh, and to uh, intru uh, include those data in in a final version of the report which is due to come uh, however uh, other than that we have not we have not uh, or in my research we have not uh, approach been approached or approached any other international collaborations uh, connected to this but I think as I mentioned Sylvia you could fill in with some of your your international collaborations? Yes. Um, yes, as, as Axel said, I, and now they're gearing up in New Zealand to run experiments in this very same scenario. Uh, just yesterday, we were discussing this with Daniel. Um, so this, this is some international data that we're going to get. We have a past experiment, I mean, the one that I did, and specifically with CERN in Switzerland, in which we managed to go there and run experiments on site uh, with people who work at the accelerator. 
Um, we have also had interest from a university in the uh, United States to run um, another experiment uh, in the US just to look at um, differences between the, the different kinds of population. And we had also had previous collaborations with uh, Norway, but that was not a project that I worked in, um, but it was a project in which um, Håkan, uh, Francis, and Daniel Nielsen worked with uh, Sintech, I believe, doing VR also with them. So yes, we are open for collaborations uh, internationally as well. Uh, we just need to find the, the group that is interested in our kind of research. Okay, very good. Um, when it comes to, to building an, an, an environment like this, uh, how much work is it? When, when does the effort pays off uh, compared to using a real world environment? How, how many experiments or, or what, what are the key issues that, that you can, I can see before you go to a VR uh, instead of a uh, real environment? Well, um, it, it's a little bit of a tricky question there um, because how how quickly you can produce a VR environment depends on several factors, starting by how complex the environment is. Um, on another hand, the more expertise you have producing virtual environments, um, the easier it gets. Uh, now we have quite a bit of expertise, I would say, at uh, Brand Technique. And we also, um, well, one of our, our colleagues, Jonathan Valquist, is also really good uh, at VR in general. So the, it depends on the team that you have and, and the, the complexity of the scenario that you need. So while we can do a, a hotel like the one that you saw now, uh, we also have thesis students doing some more simple scenarios. Um, yeah, probably much, much simpler, looking for some more basic um, behaviors in VR. So it really depends on what you want to do. So you can be a beginning and produ produce something, or you can be, um, you can even do this professionally. Like there are companies that do VR professionally and they can produce them probably even faster than we can. Uh, right now, we're not um, VR professionals um, by job definition. Um, and on the other hand, and uh, what you were saying, Matthias, so is it, what would be the difference with doing it in reality? Well, it really depends again. As I mentioned in the presentation, we could gather some data that it was not possible to gather without causing like large business uh, disruptions in the hotel. So then VR was a good alternative. In the experiment for CERN, uh, we did in the, uh, well, we simulated something similar to the Large Hadron Collider, that is this huge accelerator that is like 27 kilometers underground, uh, well, in, the, in perimeter and it's underground. And when we asked CERN if we can run it there one day, and they were like, it's impossible. I mean, we cannot stop the accelerator for experiments like this, so it's just not possible. So they didn't have much of an alternative, and then VR had to, had to come. Um, to to get that data, so I would say it, there are many parameters that play a role there on whether VR is the most um, is the best tool that you can you can use for a given experiment. Yeah, and uh, just to uh, a note on the field experiment is that I mean it it, it may take a week or a few weeks to to build a, a VR model. Uh, for Sylvia and Jonathan, which are, they are really, really good. I worked with both uh, Jonathan and Sylvia, who are very, very, very talented in building VR models, uh, in my opinion. And you have several advantages of those uh, couple of weeks. You could uh, vary technical systems in any way you want. You could run experiments anytime you want. Uh, you have the, the possibility to um, uh, do experiments without uh, exposing the the participants to any um, unethical stress conditions. Uh, when we when we were applying for the the field experiment, we had a very long uh, ethical review process to be able to verify that we did uh, ethical research, and then we had to uh, talk to the hotel 
and the discussions with the hotel uh, took us uh, about six to eight months. And then we had to find uh, a slot when they didn't have too much people at the hotel so we could occupy a whole floor, which took another six months. And then uh, one, when we did it, we had to be five researchers on spot to be able to uh, monitor the participant all the way to make sure that they weren't uh, uh, too stressed. To, so we had to uh, abort uh, the experiment. Uh, so we had five people on spot on a hotel, uh, uh, not very close to us. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, also, we couldn't uh we could do some minor differences in like this flashing light over my head uh, here uh but we couldn't change the, the voice message easily uh we couldn't change the the corridor layout we couldn't uh, mixture with the stuff uh, basically uh we had what we got and we were also compromised to the uh, the hotel setting so we could that's as Sylvia mentioned in the in the presentation that's one of the reasons we didn't study waiting times because uh, it was just not possible for us uh, once they we couldn't control the elevators in the hotel uh, pretty much so once they pushed the button the elevator would come uh, we could not control that waiting time uh, so so there there's a lot of work in field research and it's also compromised with a lot of parameters you can't really modify, which are the, I would say, the, the real, uh, uh, the big benefits or opportunities with VR is that we have full control of the environment all the time. Uh, on the other hand, we're losing some realism, of course, but, but we're, uh, we're getting closer. And I think we're getting pretty close. Yeah, good, very good. Um, you mentioned the voice alarm and, and uh, you, you also mentioned the possibilities to change things uh, to compare but I also have a number of questions uh, concerning that and one is uh, I know that you have both been studying voice alarm in different ways uh, and one question is, is do you have any um, specific things that you have noticed that that may improve uh, the voice alarm to, to, to increase the effect of it? Um, any, sp any special thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, I could start. Uh, I think that um, regarding the voice alarm, it is obvious in all the trials we've done that it has a, a huge effect on the evacuation. Uh, it's also <clears throat> pretty evident that most people uh, actually follow the alarm or understands the alarm, uh, understands what they're saying. Uh, we had one person in in the field experiment who chose one out of, we had 66 participants in the uh, field experiments where three in total chose the stairwell. And one of those people uh, uh, misunderstood the, uh, the reason he, uh, he or she uh, chose the stairwell was uh, because of a misunderstanding of the, the voice alarm uh, where he or she uh, said afterwards that it said that I shouldn't use the elevator uh, whilst mm -hmm. the, the alarm message was that, it, that you could use the elevator. Uh, also, we've tried a, a couple of different messages uh, to try to calm people in the hotel lobby, for example. Uh, I think... Uh, I, Sylvia may correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think in Christine's, uh, uh, Christine Andres' uh, cave environment, it was a, a different message in the, in the hotel lobby, uh, which we were, again, not able to replicate in the, in the field experiment. <clears throat> uh, but overall, I think that the major implications is that people... Uh, understands it and listens to it in the way we've tried it. However, there are previous research from Daniel Nielsen, uh, for example, where uh, they looked at how much information could you put in the, uh, uh, the voice message and people will still understand it. Uh, and I think they have uh, guidance in it. it's a loon technical report, uh, guidance on how many parts of information you can still understand 
while, while given in the, the voice alarm. So, and, and in the experiments we've run, we've followed these uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, from what we can see, it, it works pretty well. Uh, I guess that's, that's the conclusion. We haven't looked at uh, different messages for uh, the same scenario. So we can't, uh, we haven't played with it and seen which way is better. Uh, right, yeah. right. Just to add to what Axel said, um, in, in those, uh, or in, in the studies made by, by Daniel before, uh, they also figure out that mentioning that there was a fire, I mean, mentioning the fire word in the, in the voice message was good because people remembered better the message that they got. Um, and in the, same, in, this, in the same way, our alarm did that. But in this case, we just had one alarm that we applied. We did not try alternatives because this study was not about which um, alarm will be, which message will be the best. But it is something that could easily be done by just changing the, the voice alarm in the VR environment and running the experiment again. Yeah, right. And I think it was even mentioned during the presentation that if you have a very long voice alarm, people tend to wait to to hear uh, the entire message before they act. And and I think yeah. maybe that is in you, you need to take that into account as well that you actually store them in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just uh, one more. <laughs> Please. Uh, it uh, in the we did the, we have done the VR uh, experiments in the subway also, which I presented previously on Bramforsk. And uh, one implication there is that uh, most, as I mentioned, most people understand and they they ref reflect over the fact that you should use the elevator, and so also the people who choose not to use the elevator uh, often mentions in their uh, in the questionnaire afterwards that uh, the voice alarm said I should use the elevator, but that didn't seem right. Uh, so, so from the from the alarms that we are, or to conclude, uh, even though the ones who, even the ones who don't follow the instructions in the alarm have seemed to, in most cases, have understood them. Okay. Very good. Um... We also have a question here about um, the age of the participants in, in your experiments. Uh, uh, you described them as quite young, and was there a reason uh, why do you, why you choose uh, young people and uh, not very much uh, old, elderly people? And do you think that made a difference on the on the outcome? Well. Um... What, what I can say is that well, we don't necessarily chose not to have older people. Um, it turns out that well, usually students are more willing to join these kind of studies. Maybe they also have time to come by and do it. Well, let's say older people, uh, not necessarily old, but just older, maybe uh, in the office, and they don't have time to come all the way to our VR lab and do the experiment. So that is probably one reason um, we have seen, and this is more in an uh, anecdotal uh, way, we have seen that some older people are more, um, I wouldn't say afraid, but more um, distrusting of the VR equipment. Uh, maybe they don't, maybe they're not that keen in, in technology. Um, maybe they just, they just don't like it. Or some people think that they're gonna get really sick if they try it. Um, even if it is a very normal virtual environment. So there is some level of distrust. And then if you see a kid trying the, the, the equipment, a kid, you basically just need to hand the VR equipment to them. They know how to put it on. They know how to operate the controllers. It is, it is so natural on them. It is, it's kind of remarkable, the difference in the, in the approach to the equipment, but it could be at, um, how used they are to that in one way or what preconceptions they have about it. So we would love to have older participants in our experiments. We always try to, to get people uh, that are older, but it's, it's, it's not always our choice. Uh, we always try to represent uh, 
the broad society, but it's not always possible, especially if the participants or oh, the volunteers don't even sign up and we cannot do much about it. Okay. Um, but yeah, it could be that it, there are some variances there in the, oh, some differences in the data. I mean, maybe their waiting time will be different and so on, but we, unless we get those participants, we can't really make conclusions. Yeah, and uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, there are there are some differences with geographical differences between uh, the places where we did the field experiments and the VR experiment where the VR lab is located at the university which of course promotes and makes it easier for students to get there and also easier to recruit uh, such uh, people to to the to the trials in the field experiments we we used a website uh, for uh, for research where where you well people interested in in being part of research can go to this website and they read about the study and then also again there was a deception story there but uh, they can sign up so we, we had quite a uh, we, we may have a bit of larger spread however uh, since we're, we're running trials with quite a few participants in total uh, it's it's very hard to find uh, age correlations and stuff like that. That would, um, I mean, it, it would be great looking at it, but it would probably be very hard because you need a lot of participants in each age group to to actually study that that stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, so, what would you say? What is the next step? Um, in developing more VR environments for for uh, evacuation studies. I'm gonna hand that to Sylvia, who's writing yeah. a thesis on VR. <laughs> yes. Well, we have a couple of ideas already uh, ongoing. Um, we're gonna run some experiments using some heat panels because we want to replicate the well have a little bit of a uh, radiation, so uh, thermal radiation. And just imagine like these domestic heaters, we, we will have some installed in the ceiling and have them activated based on a smoke layer um, that you see in VR, but now you feel the, the radiation coming towards you. So we want to enhance the experience, make it more realistic. Of course, it will never be too high. Um, it will be a very low uh, level of radiation. Like if you can imagine up to like what it's like to be in the sun. Um, I mean, when you feel the sunlight, the sunlight on your skin, I mean, and we can vary that intensity. So from nothing to up to that, just to see if that makes the experience more realistic. Because in some experiments in which we had uh, smoke piling up in the, at ceiling level and coming down, some participants disregarded the smoke completely while others took it very seriously. So we wanted to see how can we engage those who disregarded it. And we thought, well, maybe if they feel, they feel some, uh, something more than just looking around and seeing black, maybe they can, they can think, well, this is not good for me. As I mentioned too, during the presentation, we are willing to look into what makes a virtual environment feel more like a real one. And the whole field of environmental psychology can give us tools to, to actually look if the environments really feel the same. And this, this tool that I mentioned like from Kuller is just one of the many that they have to see. And they, uh, they are, um, oh, this is this research group in, in, at Lund University too that we have worked with before. And they, they are specialized in looking into this kind of stuff. I mean, is, is your environment, how does this environment affect the person that is there? And how does the person there um, affect the environment? As I mentioned, you could see clear differences between the, the picture of the real hallway and the VR hallway. Um, and we want to see, we want to learn how can we make them feel more similar, even though we know that just realism, just looking exactly realistic is not, is not it. There are more things playing a role. So those are some of the ideas, and we're also looking into training. We want to see the, the benefits of doing training in VR 
uh, that could be more for the um, fire and rescue services, or it could be for people in a building. We have had some evacuation training done before in the economy uh, faculty at the university, and they, they use VR for their training. Um, well, at least it was a collaboration that they did also with Daniel in, in the past. So there are different options that we're exploring. And with each experiment, we learn something new that we managed to incorporate in the following one. So um, I'm very happy of this. Well, it's still a work in progress, but we actually have made uh, quite a bit of progress in the last couple of years. Oh, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. I, I could just add also uh, shortly that we've, in the we, in the subway trials that we did, we looked at different types of movement, how you move in the in the model, where we usually traditionally use hand controllers, while we also looked at a, a mixed uh, setup where we tried to to have this kind of VR shoes that you walk around to simulate the movement in another way. And we had a implication on differences uh, between the trials with and without shoes, uh, which I think could be worth looking more at as well. And I mean, as, as you hear, Silvia uh, mentions a lot of research, which is really exciting at looking at how how we improve the VR environment from something that we in this uh, research show is actually pretty good at at uh, predicting the behavior in a real world environment. And if we do make it even better, it, it, it has giant, or it could have <laughs> giant, uh, we could have, it could have very, large or at least uh, interesting impact on the, the field of human behavior research in, in evacuations. And we, we get the possibilities to look, for example, at environments which are not built yet and how to design the evacuation in these environments when we're trying out different new systems like evacuation elevators, for example, which is more of my field of research. This, right. uh, if we get a VR model, which is very realistic and works very good, we do have the possibilities to look at the, how does the different evacuation systems actually work in, in uh, something that looks like the environment which is going to be built. And that is, uh, I think, very exciting. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, time is uh, running out for us and we should just uh, wrap things up here. And um, thank you. Silvia and Axel, and uh, thank you for all the good questions uh, that you've sent in to us. And if you'd like to attend more Ground Force webinars, you can find them at our website. Um, you can also follow us, follow us on LinkedIn, or you can register to our newsletter, uh, and you can do it at, at the bottom of our website. Uh, right now, we only have a Swedish website up. We're working on the English version, coming up soon, I hope. We also have a YouTube channel where you can uh, find earlier webinars and recorded se seminars. And I also like to um, to thank my my colleagues. Uh, this is the Brandfork webinar team. Uh, you haven't seen them, but they have been in the background all the time. Francis and Matthias, thank you very much for a very uh, very good job. Uh, And uh, you will all get a questionnaire tomorrow and please answer that. That's very valuable for us. And I hope to see you again soon uh, in our webinars. And we have many, many coming up uh, this fall. Uh, next one is early in October. Um, and you can look into that at our website. So thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>